Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 333. Hello, Trail Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health Podcast. Today's interview is part two. Part one was episode 332 with Dr. Carolyn McMakin. Today is the continuation and completion of our two-part interview with her. So if you haven't listened to episode 332 with Dr. Carolyn McMakin, I highly recommend going back and listening to that episode and then coming here to listen to episode 333. We dive into how she uses her technology and how all of her practitioners use this technology to heal different diseases. A gynecologist uses it to support women in healing C-sections. Sports medicine practitioners use it in football and hockey to support healing bones faster and ligaments and tendons faster kidney stones, Parkinson's, the list goes on and on. So we talk about all kinds of interesting topics, autoimmune disease, and different ways that she can help you to support you on your healing journey. I'm very excited to have brought you all this information. Something else I'm really excited to bring you is freedoctorcourse.com. I get together with some of my favorite naturopathic physicians local to me, and we filmed videos, the foundations of health, those tips and tricks that are going to support you in building a strong and healthy body holistically. So if you're interested in learning some great information, which I know you are from holistic experts, Go to freedoctorcourse.com. I created that website to support you in your holistic health journey. So go to freedoctorcourse.com and check that out. And let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. You can join our Facebook group, Learn True Health Facebook group. And let me know how you enjoyed learning from our naturopathic physicians, freedoctorcourse.com. Enjoy today's interview. Now, what about the immune system or like autoimmune conditions? You know, can you, uh, are there frequencies to support a healthy and robust immune system or to support, you know, healing an autoimmune condition and bring the body back into balance? Absolutely. I mean, that's, this is, these kinds of, of case reports, the pain patients are where we started. I mean, we've been doing this 22 years. When I say we, it's like me and the staff and the practitioners and the faculty and everybody that has helped develop this. I teach the classes and I started it, but I certainly don't do this by myself. So the whole FSM community. um, So we started out treating pain. And then in 2000, we found out we could treat the spinal cord. And then... We started treating stroke patients, thalamic pain patients in 2002, and then found out we could treat the nervous system, and then found out there's a frequency for the vagus nerve and the medulla Mm -hmm. and the immune system and the gut. So when you look at autoimmune disease and when you get enough mileage, seeing enough really ill, chronically ill patients, whether it's autoimmune or just chronic illness, there are certain patterns that become apparent. So autoimmune disease, we have this this category, autoimmune disease, and it includes rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, psoriasis, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, you know, just examples. And all of those are conditions where your immune system has decided that, let's just say scleroderma, your immune system has decided that your connective tissue and your capillaries belong to somebody else. So they get incredibly inflamed. And then because of the inflammation, they scar. That's just scleroderma. Rheumatoid arthritis your immune system decides that your synovial membranes inside your joints are belong to somebody else. When I started seeing larger numbers of these, we have frequencies for the immune system 
and it works okay. We have frequencies to reduce inflammation and dissolve scar tissue. So we can approach autoimmune patients in a pretty um, nuts and bolts kind of fashion. But there's always been something missing until about a year or two ago. And that's when we found out. It, almost everybody knows, anybody that sees autoimmune patients, if you ask in history, so I just did a research project in England with scleroderma patients, and we had six patients in three days that we treated. And I asked all six of them, what was going on one to three months prior to the onset of the inflammatory phase of your scleroderma. So they were all chronic and scarred with their hands, you know, really restricted in motion. Mm -hmm. What happened three months before? Every single one of them, every rheumatoid arthritis patient I've ever had, every single one of them say that there was some incredibly stressful period of their lives that immediately preceded the onset of their autoimmune condition. Or they had an infection. So Crohn's patients will oftentimes get food poisoning, ulcerative colitis patients, food poisoning, or a bacterial infection, or a pathogen, or a parasite. Activates the immune system, and then the immune system just never turns off. And in the process of that, attacks gets confused. And my favorite pre-med class was immunology. So the immune system develops these antibodies that cross-link between whatever started the trouble and your synovial joints or your colon or your capillaries. So you have this inflammatory condition. And about two years ago, one of my practitioners did a presentation on the vagus nerve. And she's a medical doctor in Mount Gambia, South Australia. And we do a Skype, FaceTime sort of update with the Australian practitioners every September. And she presented this thing on the vagus. And she pointed out that the, the vagus is what... Um, is has as its job to slow down your heart rate and to improve your digestion, help you secrete digestive enzymes and stomach acid. So the vagus improves your digestion, slows your heart rate, and the vagus suppresses your immune system. I didn't know that part. So she does this presentation and it's like, well, I knew it quieted the heart rate because I, in 2002, I treated a patient in a cardiologist's office that had ventricular tachycardia. And by using the frequency to increase secretions in the vagus, I took his heart rate from 136 to 67 in about 45 seconds. Wow. Scared the hell out of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, holy, so... I didn't do that again. And I kind of warned everybody off of treating the vagus. Well, then I found out what it's good for. So I am the number one FSM lab rat. I sat on the couch in the living room and I, my, my resting pulse is 62. And I treated myself to increase secretions in my vagus and my resting pulse stayed 62. So unless your elevated heart rate is caused by the vagus, you can treat the vagus safely. It's like, okay, so I found that out. Now, that third function of the vagus is to suppress the immune system. All right, so you have those three things it does. It quiets the heart rate, improves digestion, and quiets the immune system. Then, because we do so much with neurology in FSM, I do this presentation on the nervous system at every advanced course. So about two years ago, I'm preparing for this lecture and I read something that just blew my mind. When you have a stressful event 
like you're running away from a tiger in the woods. You don't want your heart rate slow. You don't want your digestion. You've got 30 minutes to live. Digesting food is not a priority. And you certainly don't want your immune system suppressed because the tiger spit has lots of germs in it. So the vagus needs to go away while you're under this threat. So the nervous system arranges that. The stress centers and the medulla and the midbrain turn off or turn down the vagus. Mm -hmm. Well, in a normal person, as soon as the infection is healed or the trauma is healed or the tiger is down the street, the midbrain quiets down, the immune, the vagus comes back on, digestion goes back to normal, the immune system gets quieted, and your heart rate goes back to normal. It is not a coincidence that 80%, it's a huge number, I think it's like 78, 80% of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and chronically ill patients have a history of early childhood trauma. Right right? Mm -hmm. Either physical or sexual abuse, surgery, trauma, accidents, all before the age of seven. It's a huge number. Well, when you look at what happens to the midbrain when you're five years old and you get beat up by, right? You're living in an unsafe environment, in a violent environment. That midbrain sets the firing threshold much lower it takes almost nothing to set off the stress centers in the middle of your brain. So you're 20, you're 14 or 16 or 22, and you have this incredibly stressful event or infection or injury. Your midbrain gets jacked up, the vagus gets turned back off, and your midbrain decided that this is serious. I'm not going back off again, and the vagus can just lump it. And the vagus stays off. Historically, if you take patient histories, within three to nine months following a major life stressor, such as infection, death in the family, divorce, whatever, within three to nine months, if you're going to develop an autoimmune disease, you do it then mm -hmm. because the vagus doesn't come back on. So when we treat autoimmune disease, I can treat the immune system, but that doesn't work. It's temporary. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fix the problem. So it, it sort of ties it all in with a bow. So the vagus goes off, that reduces stomach acid and enzymes and reduces gut motility. Well, everybody has SIBO now, right? Right. Right. And it's like, no, just no. If you have appropriate pH in your gut and it's acid, the bacteria from your large bowel won't live in the small intestine. You can do anything you want to diet and antibiotics and whatever, and the SIBO is not going to go away unless you get the stomach acid and the pH in the small bowel normal. How are you going to do that? Treat the vagus. How are you going to get the vagus to go back on? we treat the medulla and the midbrain. It is breathtaking once you see the connections, and these are not connections you would see unless you had a way to treat them. Mm -hmm. Once you have something, I can take somebody in atrial fib. My, my husband developed atrial fib after his hip surgery in July. His heart rate goes to 132, and I can take it back down to 65, in about 20 seconds by running the frequency to increase secretions in the vagus. Mm. So once you have a tool that lets you do that, once I started seeing how it all works together, Crohn's, SIBO, um, asthma, it's always stress. There's, it's always, you have to treat the local tissue. So I have to treat the infection that started the asthma or treated the immune hypersensitivity that started the asthma. But then the other thing you have to do is treat the medulla to quiet it down, treat the midbrain to quiet it down, let the vagus come back on and quiet down the immune system. It's, it just 
all ties together once you see it as a whole and you have a tool that'll let you do all of that and you see it all together. So you don't just use bronchodilators. I used to sell bronchodilators. I, I called on respiratory physicians for 16 years, 14 years. So you don't just use bronchodilators or immune suppressants, fix it. Right. Fix the gut, right? Fix the gut. So 85% of the immune system is clustered around the gut. Once your gut starts leaking, the immune system is going to stay jacked up because it's all excited about the, the peptides and stuff that's coming around, across your, your gut wall. So you start out with asthma and you end up with food sensitivities that include gluten, milk, and corn or eggs. Mm -hmm. Those go together because it's the same problem. Isn't that cool? It is so cool. <laughs> is it? It's so cool. So, so someone comes to you with one of these conditions, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, any of the host of autoimmune conditions, and they go through these treatments, getting to the root cause. Are they completely in remission? Do they get a hundred percent back to health? Uh, can't put tissue back that's not there. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you are a patient with swan neck deformities from rheumatoid arthritis, no, I can't put tissue back. That's not there. I can get you out of pain. And the, the challenge with autoimmune patients is it, it really is not a one visit fix. So you have to kind of do it all. So autoimmune patient comes in, let's say with rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Here's the deal. You don't get to eat wheat, corn, eggs, soy, milk, or citrus for three months. And the patient gets kind of glassy eyed. <laughs> and then, and this is assuming they're not on biologicals. So if they, back in the day when they just put them on um, methotrexate or steroids first, that was actually easier. If they're on biologicals, it's a game changer. But let's just say they haven't gone that route yet. So you take them off all the foods they're allergic to. You have to treat the gut. Why? Because 85% of the immune system is clustered around the gut. So if the immune system has decided that your synovial joints belong to somebody else, the immune system is going to be jacked up about everything else too. So you take them off of the foods they're allergic to, and then you treat the gut, treat the immune system, quiet down the medulla, quiet down the midbrain, you treat the vagus, and then you treat the joints. And then you see how it goes. And this is, it's not, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's, it's not like, well, it's been two weeks and that's a really good looking corn tortilla or, oh, it's just sourdough. I'll just have one piece. No. Right. So it's a it's a it's a time period, but there are practitioners in the US and Germany and the UK that combine FSM, their their medical doctors or naturopaths, they combine FSM with functional medicine with an integrated metabolic um, comprehensive way of looking at how everything works and it's connected. And um, and you combine it all. So I'd say the most difficult ones are the patients where the immune system is aggravated because you have a root canal or you have mold in your house and you have a mold infection in your gallbladder, your sinuses, your bronchi, whatever. Those are the most difficult because the, the dental work to get rid of a an occult dental infection is ex it's expensive. It's difficult to find a dentist that's going to do it. That's not easy. Like I, I had Hashimoto's and was on thyroid and adrenal replacement for five or six years. And then my dentist, I have an integrative dentist in California. She found, she did imaging called a 3D cone beam that found about half of my jaw, basically the back half on both sides, upper and lower, was just gone, it's just necrotic. Mm. I had eight root canals. So we started with the surgeries, took out the infected teeth, took out the infected bone. Um, I didn't have any molars for about 
two and a half years. But when he took out the last centimeter of infected bone and the last infected tooth, two weeks later, my anti-thyroid antibodies were zero and I no longer needed thyroid. And two weeks after that, so four weeks after that last surgery, I no longer needed adrenal replacement. Mm. And I'd been on hydrocortisone for five years. I didn't make any, like I didn't have any. It was pretty grisly. So that's part of the way I found out about how this all goes together. So the dental infection and mold infection, because I've had both, um, they jack up the immune system. And they're the most difficult because the remediation is so expensive. Mm-hmm. You have to fix the house. There's prescription drugs. There's, I mean, it's a, it's a thing. So those are more complicated. But the average garden variety, my mom went crazy and got really abusive for two years when I was 12 or 13. And I developed rheumatoid arthritis when I was 14. And now I get a little bloated and I have body pain when I ate gluten. Those are easy, uh, relatively speaking. It was really fascinating hearing about the jaw infection because I think that's, or a mold, um, you know, sensitivity. That's, uh, th- unfortunately, that's sometimes, the, that's sometimes the last place people look and mm-hmm. that's the root cause, you know, to, to, yep. to have dental issues or to have a mold in the home can be um, the root cause. And, and uh, we're just looking absolutely everywhere. And then we finally, you know, years later, find that it's mold or find that it's um, an infection in the jaw. Well, now, what about uh, creating a frequency to kill the infection instead of having to go through all the dental work? Is that possible? Yeah. Well, they have, we have frequencies that are alleged to be for infectious, um, what do they call it? Pus and pus encapsulated or infectious agents. And there are frequencies for certain parasites and certain bacteria in the advanced, especially strep and staph. There's like six frequencies for each one of those. And I had a naturopath in Australia who had this huge red spot on her thigh with streaks going up and down. And I said, that is beta hemolytic strep. She said, yeah, I have an infected tooth. And I said, you need to go to the emergency room like right now. This was the last day I was there. I was leaving the next day. I said, you need to go. And she said, I would rather die of infection than take an antibiotic. And it's like, well, you might have that chance. And so there's a frequency, there's this six frequencies for strep. And I, my, one of the other practitioners treated her like we're all in one hotel room and they're doing facials on me and she's sitting on the other bed and it's like, okay, run these. So they ran those. And at the end of an hour, hour and a half, the spot was down the size from about eight inches across. It was down the size of a quarter. And the next morning, the abscess in her tooth ruptured and she was fine. Okay. I have no idea what we did. The frequencies that we use are too low. Like rife frequencies are high enough and complex enough to blow up biological organisms. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that it is possible for a frequency below a thousand hertz to blow up a bacteria. So that's just the patient reacts to it. The pain will go down. The bloating will go down. The like when there's a parasite or an infection in the appendix, I can get the pain temporarily down, but it, it won't keep it down. So there's, there's just the pragmatic aspect about how, whether or not the frequencies are adequate to do that. And the consensus among the FSM faculty and kind of our upper tier of, of experts is, yeah, I don't think so. And then there's the other piece of this in naturopathic medicine and in medicine in general, there's that dictum that says, first, do no harm. It's like, I don't want to withhold appropriate medical intervention Mm -hmm. on the off chance that a frequency is going to kill this bug. People die of sepsis. Mm -hmm. People die of infections. This is not something to get. No, 
it's just not safe. It's not smart. It's not responsible. And I, the first, first rule is do no harm. So if you come in and I use the frequent and you've got a lot of chest congestion and I use the frequencies for pneumonia and your chest gets warm and your coughing gets better and you get sleepy and your tissue softens up. My next step is you go next door and you come back here when you're on antibiotics. And that's, that is my approach. Once you're, once you've done appropriate medical care, then, then we can add FSM to whatever else you're doing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I really appreciate that you are so logic based and ethical and grounded in, you know, what FSM is amazing for. And also then saying, you know, here's the limits. It's not the cure all, mm -hmm. but we need, nope. this is a, a, a tool that should be in every practitioner's tool belt. And we yep. also need to know what its limits are. And so I appreciate yep. that because, you know, there's other people out there with technologies that say this is, this is the cure-all for everything. And, and so I'm, I appreciate that, that you're not one of those people. Yay. Me too. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's how you survive long-term because mm -hmm. my goal for FSM is to, these are, these have, this is our, um, I guess it's the goals. Uh, it's to treat every patient in pain or now every patient who wants to be treated, who needs to be helped um, to, to treat them by teaching practitioners, by teaching practitioners who can provide the treatment. And then the third step of our mission statement, or our goal is to teach, research, write, and speak about FSM in such a way that it survives. And that means you have to be responsible and clear and to the extent that it is possible, fact-based. One of the basic principles of science is observation and reproducibility. What did you see? You do this and that happens. Huh. And then you do this and that happens again under the same circumstances. It's like, Hmm. And after a period of time, you now know that if you do this, that will happen. It becomes from reproducible, it becomes predictive. But it all starts with observation. And one of the other rules of science is you can't th throw out the data because it doesn't match your model. There is no model for how you get a new injury repaired in four hours. That just there's it, nobody has a model for that. We had to create the model because we did it, and then mm -hmm. we did it, and then we did it forty or fifty times, and then it's like, okay, we're doing this. So now, what's the model? You can't throw out the data because it doesn't match your model. Nobody on the planet has ever reduced cytokines in ninety minutes. Nobody can't be done. Well, we did it. It's reproducible. It's predictable. Therefore, you can't throw out the data because it doesn't match your model. This technology should be in every hospital in the ICU. And the second people get out of surgery, they should be hooking them up to this machine so that they walk out of the hospital hours or days sooner, mm -hmm. having sped up their healing. Like this should be standard. It's, we're get, it's going to be another 10 or 20 years. I mean, when we talk about medicine, we have to remember that we're talking about a profession that took 50 years years to learn to wash its hands <laughs> okay so just saying and it starts with we're, we're actually doing that i have had both my hips replaced this jaw infection and gluten sensitivity caused my both my hips to degenerate just mm. crazy so i had my hip replaced and normally hip replacement patients bruise from their pretty much from their hip to their toe, the black and blue. I didn't bruise at all. And because the device is approved as if it is a TENS device, I asked the surgeon, can I use this as soon as I get back to my room? I, I need to use it within four hours. And he said, yeah, sure. So he wrote the orders. 
I get to use his written orders said, okay, to use weird chiropractic electrical gadget. <laughs> but I, as long as he signed them, I didn't care. And I, I didn't bruise. One of our practitioners is an OBGYN. He's done, he actually did a collected case report with data and a control group on post-operative care for C-section patients. Oh my gosh. They right. get out of the hospital half a day earlier. And their pain, instead of between being between a three and a seven, is between a zero and a three. So they have less pain, use less meds, and they're out of the hospital half a day sooner. Okay, so we're starting. I mean, you've got the right vision. There is one frequency combination. The only thing it's good for is kidney stone pain, just the pain. You're out of pain in 20 minutes. You run out for an hour. Pain relief lasts for two or three days until you pass the stone. There's another set of frequencies that dissolve the stone. It takes research and case reports published before you can even do clinical trials. It takes research to get to move the needle, to move the information forward into the standard of practice. Mm -hmm. The drug companies invented um, the gold standard, the double-blind placebo-controlled trial, didn't used to be the gold standard. Most of medicine prior to 1990, they didn't do double-blind placebo-controlled trials. It wasn't the gold standard, but the pharmaceutical companies figured out that they're the only ones that can afford to do them. Right. They're incredibly expensive. Yeah. So, okay. So now that's where the bar is set. And I have spent 22 years training clinicians. I've published eight papers. One of our practitioners in Ireland published a controlled trial on delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, one of our practitioners at Cleveland Clinic just published a, a paper on torticollis. University of uh, Leeds in England is starting the work on the scleroderma project. So there are so if it just was good for one thing, it'd be easy. But to move the research forward in all of these different areas. It just takes time and clinicians don't publish papers. So I've now got a, a tier of practitioners that are in medical institutions and higher institutions that are used to publishing. It doesn't scare them. So now that's that's like the next step. And then you just keep on keeping on. I mean, I decided. Can, do we have time for one more story? Oh, yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> We have all <laughs> as much time as you have. <laughs> um, there, early, early on, my my biggest fear was like early on, 97, 98, 99, my biggest fear was that I'd do something out of ignorance or um, inexperience that would just screw this up. And, and prevent it from getting out to a broader base. I was just like, you know, anxious about that. And um, so I had a patient who came in on a, on a Monday. She came, she was referred in 2000, I think, from her pain doctor in Idaho. So she came over from Idaho on a Monday, she had uh, fibromyalgia, full body pain from an auto accident. Um, she had what used to be called RSD or complex regional pain syndrome, which is just an exquisitely painful um, nerve pain condition where the nerves disconnect from the peripheral blood vessels and the sympathetics so her right leg was 22 degrees colder than her left leg hmm. when, yeah, when they installed the spinal cord stimulator. So she came in on opiates with a spinal cord stimulator with her pain level at a seven to an eight, eight and a half on all that with the spinal cord stimulator and opiates. And we had already developed the 40 and 10, the fibromyalgia protocol. So I ran that. I had some experience with treating RSD. So at the, the end of three hours on the first day, 
she left the office pain-free with the temperature in her leg normal and the sensation in her leg normal. Day two, she came in, her pain was a six, five, six, not an eight. Okay, we did the same thing. Treated the RSD, treated the spinal cord, started treating her neck injury, left the office pain-free. Third day, body pain was pretty much gone. It was, the fibromyalgia was gone by Wednesday. It's like, that's cool. So then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we treated the RSD. And so by f- Thursday, the RSD was gone in the right leg. Friday, we kind of finished it up. And she was staying in her parents' motor home that was in a mobile home park here in Portland. And um, it had a pool. And I said, go home and swim, recondition, and we'll f- see what's left on Monday. Well, what she did was she went, back to the motorhome and took herself off opiates over the weekend. So she spent the weekend sweating, chills, throwing up on the phone with her husband in Idaho. But by Sunday night, she was off of opiates. So she comes in Monday and what she had left was this low back pain from a facet joint that had been slammed in the accident. So I started treating the muscles in her low back, the facet joint, but I knew by Monday afternoon I was not going to get it by Friday when she had to leave. So I called um, the physiatrist that used to be here in Portland that did my spinal injections. He was exquisitely competent, careful, compassionate. He used um, little Versed so people didn't have any pain during the procedure, didn't remember it. And I called him Monday afternoon and I said, can you do her facet joints on on, uh, Thursday? He said, yeah, and get her in. It's like, okay. No, actually it was Friday. So her husband came over from Idaho Thursday night. Roy Slack injected her L3-4 facet joint Friday afternoon. She's no nerve pain. No fibromyalgia, no body pain. After the injection, she came in on Monday and it was done. She was completely pain-free. She had the spinal cord stim unit removed uh, about eight, six or eight months later when we were sure it wasn't going to come back. And it was done. And after her, after that, I decided that if she was the only reason her recovery was the only reason that I had developed FSM. Mm. It was it was all good. I was even. I there was no way I could lose or do anything wrong after that. And that was 18 years ago. And she is still recovered. She's my friend on Facebook. Yeah. And her story is in the book, The Resonance Effect, which um, got published by North Atlantic Books, which is a subsidiary of Penguin and Random House. It got published in 2017, 18, 2017, I think. Um, and so that story, that that book, The Resonance Effect, is the story of all of this, how FSM was developed, how all these cases, and it's got frequencies for the visceral conditions and uh, frequencies that talk about the treatment of asthma and how we developed that and all of that. And the way that book came to be, speaking of do it right and stay grounded, was starting in 99 when I was treating fibromyalgia patients, people said, you have to write a book for patients. It's like, no, if you write a a consumer book, if you write a book for the patients first, you'll never be accepted by, by medicine. You have to do it in a certain order. So you publish clinical trials or papers first. Then the next step is a textbook. And I did that. And then the next step was going to be the consumer book. Well, I was just, there is, you're more likely to get struck by lightning twice than you are (laughs) to get a book published by submitting an unsolicited manuscript. So I didn't even bother. So October of, did I start that? It was probably October of 15, 2015. Um, I got a phone call from an editor 
at North Atlantic Books. And he said, I've had Crohn's disease for 15 years. Oh. One of your practitioners just put me into a mission in two weeks. Yes. In four treatments. And I want to know why I've never heard of you. <laughs> and it's like, why don't you have a book? And I said, nobody ever asked. He said, well, I'm asking now. So he sort of held my hand through the, the, um, the submission and the chapter proposal. So you write a sample chapter or two and you submit the proposal. So I wrote something that was a little more textbooky than it should have and sent it to him. He sent it back and said, no, unpack it. Tell the story. Okay. So that's where the resonance effect came from. So I wrote the first three chapters between December of 15 and March of 16. And then you start teaching seminars and there's no time. And then um, I was supposed to write it in June and July of 16. It was due September. And something came up. The, the people that were running the seminar company, the device company, both left the same night, the day before I left for Kuwait to teach a seminar. So when I got home, I hired Kevin and I spent two months working in my office. I didn't see patients. I worked in the seminar office, learned how to run that. And then I still had chapters three through nine to write. So I went to Colorado and holed up in Roger Billica's mountain cabin. <laughs> and I wrote six chapters in eight days. Did you use a frequency machine to like calm your nerves to, to bring down oh. your stress levels? To, is there a frequency for focus and calm? Oh, yeah. It's like, I don't, when you say it, sh every, it should be in everybody's house at this point, I don't know how people live without it. I had, because I got this mold infection, mm. I had gastroparesis. I had, my vagus was completely paralyzed. I had no gag reflex. I had reflux. I had gastroparesis. Mm. Neil Nathan took care of killing the mold and put me on prescription medications. I was on prescription meds for a year and a half, but the microcurrent, kept me alive. I got rid of the paralysis in the vagus in two weeks, I had a gag reflex back. I tr heart health and um, breast health to reduce inflammation, treat my gut, treat for sleep, treat, yeah, I treat myself every single night. And we've got a, a, mag a con magnetic converter that converts the electrical pulses to magnetic pulses, frequency specific magnetic pulses. So I get the little magnetic converter in my nightstand. I have my little custom care in my nightstand. I program it with the things I need most often, common cold. Um, I don't get sick much, but, uh, and, and I run it every night. And so it's stuff doesn't scare me. Right. When you know, you can get rid of it. Right. It's like, really? I was playing water volleyball with this little beach ball and I, and I gave myself a, a partial thickness rotator cuff tear. It's like, really, really? I just did that. That's okay. So I sit on the couch for two hours at night and fix it. How do, how, it doesn't scare me. It just makes life so much fun. <laughs> I think every listener now wants to be able to have one and do it themselves. So, so uh -huh. holistic practitioners, doctors, those with um, uh, a great deal of understanding of anatomy, those people sh should take your courses. But what about the right. lay person? They should buy your book. And is there is there a way for us as lay people to get, buy one of these machines and learn how to use it on ourselves? Well, that's a challenge because, um, yeah, the lay people buy the book find a practitioner, um, get yourself treated. It's just, it's an incredible tool. The challenge and the, the course is aimed at medically trained professionals. So when patients wander into the room, it doesn't usually go well. There's just because 50% of the class is differential diagnosis. And that involves kind of a knowledge of how the system works. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to treat yourself, let's say somebody has leg pain. I can't even, I've lost count. 
the number of people that come in and say, I have sciatica. And they, and they trace their hand down their leg. And they've been told they have a sciatica. Right. They trace their hand down their leg. And what they, uh, what they have is trigger points in the glute minimus and medius. Exact, it, and it's down the side of the leg, not the back. But I have leg pain. And my doctor says I have sciatica. Right. Here, take Advil. Well, Ugh. if you treat the nerve and the disc, it's not going to do anything for the trigger points mm -hmm. in the glute medius and minimus. And if you're going to treat the glute medius and minimus, you actually kind of sort of have to have an idea of why they develop trigger points in the first place. So yeah, you can get rid of the trigger points just with the micro, the frequencies and the microcurrent, but they're going to come back if you don't think about why they have them. So that is usually beyond the capacity of the average layperson or patient. It's actually sometimes beyond the capacity of some of my practitioners because it's like if you have leg pain, it's sciatica. And if you have trigger points in the muscle, well, then it's trigger points in the muscle, but you don't think about the fact that your SI joint is loose and that's why you have trigger points in the glute medius and minimus. So you have to treat the SI joint and the muscle and then the leg pain goes away and it stays away. So that's why patients have, it's a little bit difficult. It's even, FSM doesn't suit every practitioner. Mm -hmm. As you can tell just from hearing the stories, you have to like solving puzzles. Why? Why do you have an autoimmune disease? Yes, yes, yes. I can treat the immune system, but it isn't very satisfying. It's not permanent. It doesn't work. Why? Ah, then you have to you have to kind of put the pieces together because the frequencies are very specific, uh, and that's that is the advantage of some of the non-specific stuff like the pulse EMF devices and the electric mats and the magnetic mats that you just lay on this mat and you feel better. Yay! That was my other question uh, about uh -huh. like the beamer is a type of frequency mm -hmm. mat. Uh, and and mm -hmm. obviously yours sounds so much more complex. Um, it doesn't even seem like it compares to the Beamer, but but nope. is the Beamer in any way similar or these frequency mats, are they in any way similar uh, to no. what you use? No, no. They're, all of them sort of harken back to the early days of microcurrent. If you look at the frequencies that the Beamer uses or uh, the other mats, they all run a frequency someplace below 10, three tenths of a hertz, three hertz, five hertz. Um, it's just, and I don't even know how they pick that number. How'd you, how did you decide on using that frequency in your mat? It's a pulsed EMF that pulses. So you want the frequency to pulse because otherwise the body gets bored with it. And some of them will even have found that if if you run the same frequency over a long period of time, the body learns to ignore it. So they'll run one frequency for a little bit and then they'll change it to a different one. But there's a limited number of them and I don't know how they pick them. And so they're, they aren't going to hurt you, but, and most people report feeling better afterwards. Um, they've got some really nice thermography pictures. Um, that I wish I had, but like I said, I train clinicians who don't tend to publish stuff. Um, so they've got good PR, they've got good advertising. Um, in some cases for some devices, it's like their advertising is better than the product. You know, mm -hmm. it's like they've got great ads and the product gives you some benefit. It's not gonna hurt you. Um, so yeah, they're they're they they work on a similar sort of like the Beamer or the Pulse DMF mats. Um, they provide a magnetic field that pulses. Well, every time you have a magnetic pulse, you move an electron. You make an electron move. Moving electrons create magnetic fields. Moving magnetic fields move electrons. They make an electron move. So these pulse DMF devices and nonspecific mats, um, 
increase energy. They reduce inflammation or they do what you can do by increasing ATP production. Okay. They don't have any proof that they increase ATP production, but that's the model. And that's why people feel better. But you, you can't dial it in to the specificity that you, that your system does because like no. you have fre it, frequencies for bone and then you've got another one for the kidneys and then the other one for the kidney stones. And so it's like, you've got hundreds and hundreds of frequencies that, and you're, you're most of what you do is diagnosing. Most of what you do is get, is, is doing that uh, problem solving, getting to the root cause and then knowing what what area of the body and which frequency to use. So that's totally different exactly. than just lying on a mat. Right. Yep. And the nice thing for the practitioners that come and take the course is I've done the heavy lifting. It's like I, I, they, they end up with um, a booklet full of protocols, what to use and a machine that'll even run the automated protocols in a certain freak sequence for certain conditions. So, and I've already made every mistake that anybody could possibly make. So they, they walk into something where they've got a background. So they're not just looking at this list of six pages of frequencies in tables and having to figure it out. That part, the basic construct of how to think about it, how to use it, what goes with what, that's already been done in 22 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but yeah, it's a whole different, it's a whole different critter. So if somebody wants a, a point and shoot like a laser or something that's just unattended, they put the patient on it, charge them 20 bucks and, and leave the room. Uh, it, it's just not, it's not how my stuff works. So there's a place for the other. I'm not dissing them. It's just different. It doesn't do what we do. Right. Could you give us, you, you've painted such a beautiful picture, but I feel like I, I'd like the full picture. Could you give us uh, like a list off the top of your head of the types of practitioners that use this? So like you said, the OBGYN, for example, because um, I mm -hmm. can see like, obviously you've talked about sports medicine right, and autoimmune and chronic pain and just the list goes on and on. So if you could run down, what are some of the most common types of doctors or therapists that come for your training and what kinds of patients do they have really great results with? Um, the people that we train are um, medical physicians. We started with chiropractors and naturopaths because they're the, they tend to be the early adopters. Medical physicians have certain constraints based on what is called the standard of care. Mm -hmm. They get hassled by their board if they try or use a lot of this alternative stuff. And sometimes the boards get aggressive. So we started out with mostly naturopaths, chiropractors, then acupuncturists. And then when Jeff Bland had me on functional medicine update in 2000, we started getting medical physicians that were functional medicine trained. And that is a perfect combination. In 2003, Metagenics sponsored my seminars for three years and got me on a nationwide circuit instead of just four seminars a year, year here in Portland. We still do eight seminars a year in, uh, across the country. And so when I was with Metagenics, their sales reps were calling on the functional medicine, medical physicians, osteopaths, um, the nurse practitioners, nurses um, in certain states, massage therapists can use it. Um, and um, so Florida, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, I think, and now Oregon, there are certain states, so we have massage therapists. They have a little bit of trouble keeping up because they're not allowed to diagnose and their knowledge of anatomy is not as detailed as people that have been through the more rigorous, longer training. Um, sports trainers, athletic trainers, it's really interesting. We've got devices with over 200 NFL, NHL, National Football League, National Hockey League, uh, haven't made a big impact on the NBA. So basketball players, not so much. 
um, some professional golfers whose names you would recognize, and uh, weightlifters. Charles Poliquin uh, met me at a, a lecture in 2002 and, no, 2003, I guess, and then Metagenics put me on their circuit, and Charles Poliquin had his team of sports trainers, about 25 of them from all over the country and Canada, came to a sports class that we taught in Phoenix in 2003. And um, so it's new injuries and um, performance. So right now we have a faculty member named Kim Pittis, who is a massage therapist, but she's a sports therapist who is osteopathically trained so it's she's got specialized in extra training and she has designed a two-day course for sports medicine people that that and she's her husband is um uh was a player in the nhl national hockey league um and they were playing in europe he got injured he got treated with fsm she took the course, got the bug, drank the Kool-Aid, and she has treated hundreds of um, hockey players, new injuries, chronic injuries, problems with adhesions and motor coordination. And she has got this two-day class of sports medicine that integrates tissue recovery, changing scar tissue so movement happens more fluidly, and then connecting the brain and the peripheral tissue with the frequencies to increase secretions in the cerebellum and the sensory and motor cortex. So you can repattern a whole movement pattern. You can do what is effectively about three months worth of work in two hours, two days. It's nuts. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's so cool. <laughs> It is so cool. And earlier you had mentioned that spinal stenosis uh, doesn't really see results. Um, is that 100% of the time or, or like cervical stenosis? Are there any times when people are able to gain some traction with your therapy? You can, you can reduce the inflammation in the cord. You can reduce the adhesions in the dura at the area of the stenosis. You have to be careful. There's something about what we do with the current that I think makes the spinal fluid move faster. And so the spinal fluid will back up against the disc that's compressing the cord and the patient will get a headache if you polarize the current. So patients with stenosis have to be treated with alternating current and, and not polarized positive current, which is Spinal cord and the nerves love to be polarized positive. Lymphedema loves to be polarized positive. Um, so you have to treat them with alternating current. You can get the pain down. Um, and then when they get to a certain point, I, I just look at them and say, look, find a surgeon that you trust. Find somebody that a hospital nurses like. Ooh. Get a source inside the operating room or inside the hospital and find out who's good. Mm -hmm. And you go to that guy, get this taken care of, then I can fix it. I can treat you after the surgery, but I can't, it's there, are, there's a point at which it's just dangerous. It's not good for the spinal cord right. to be really that squished. And most of us don't discover spinal stenosis till it's too late. Right. Right. So, yeah, it gets in the. We have to be careful with it, but it's not a contraindication. It's just you have to work around it, and you can make the patient more comfortable. And if you can get the patient moving, sometimes the stenosis is gets better because the calcifications get reabsorbed. Mm -hmm. If you can get something to move, the body will reabsorb the calcium. Bone spurs. Mm -hmm. you get rid of bone spurs. It's easy. You just treat the connective tissue and the periosteum for calcifications. And then you get the muscle and the tendon moving. And once it's moving, well, about two months, this, the bone spurs are gone. So people who have a stenosis should at least attempt this. This is a good, uh, sure. a good to, to go down this route and, um, and see how far they get 
Um, yeah. And then, you know, cons- always, always surgery is an option, but to it's good to try everything else first. Yeah. Well, and then we can treat you after right. the surgery. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and th- I mean, the other thing with this is, uh, with with few exceptions, uh, when you run a frequency, that was the first thing I spent the first year doing. It's like finding out that if a frequency doesn't work, is it going to hurt you? Mm. And after about a year, the answer was no. Unless I drop the box on your foot, <laughs> I, it's not going to hurt. And it might help. If it helps, it tells you something. If it doesn't help, well... You look at it a different way and try a different thing. And sometimes what I do is not what's going to fix what you have. It's it's not it's not Harry Potter. Right. It's reproducible. Right. It's physics. Right. What about Parkinson's, MS, ALS? These kind of you know uh, long term degenerative neurological issues. A, 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 dealing with a lot of inflammation. Um, but, have you seen the ability to put it into remission or to slow down the, the yeah. progress of it? Yep. With ALS and MS, I can't put tissue back. That's not there. I can take off. We had one, I, I worked with a neurologist over the weekend, one, one year, 98, 99, probably. And no, 99, 2000. And we saw eight patients in two days and found out that if we take off scar tissue, if we remove the sclerosis, it can actually make the symptoms a little bit worse. Mm-hmm. Um, you can reduce the inflammation. So we had one patient, um, this was someplace in Colorado, uh, we had one of her patients who, who was on an anti-inflammatory diet, he, no gluten, He as long as he stayed out of the heat, he had no symptoms of MS. She'd put him with nutrition and um, microcurrent. She'd put him into remission in about 18 months. So that was magic. Um, and so we've had enough cases like that where you can slow the progression. I've got data that says I can reduce all of the inflammatory cytokines and lipoxygenase and cyclooxygenase mediated inflammation. I've got objective data on that. So since ALS and MS are inflammatory, I've got data that says that's worth a try. It's not going to hurt you and might help slow it down. With Parkinson's, I can't put tissue back that's not there. But we can, we've done it enough times that I can say this, we can improve the symptoms for 24 to 48 hours to the point where the patient now walks normally, doesn't have a tremor, um, right? So we can improve the symptoms and you have to do things with supplements and functional medicine to improve the mitochondrial function in the substantia nigra. So you treat the substantia nigra with the frequencies for removing toxicity and degeneration and scarring and increasing secretions. When you increase secretions in the basal ganglia, it stops the tremor. That's like, we've done it enough times that it's, that happens. Getting it to stay in remission is supporting dopamine secretion in the body with nutritional supplements, with lipoic acid and CoQ10 and vitamin E and fish oil, and then um, tyrosine and phenylalanine to support, to provide, and copper to provide the precursors to dopamine. And when you do all of that, you can get Parkinson's into remission. I have a patient that was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2005. And the neurologist said, ah, you got a nickel's worth of Parkinson's. He had a significant tremor. His voice was real hoarse and weak. His face was lacking in expression. His state, he, his gait was still normal, but it was stiff. His body was stiff. And that's usually the way Parkinson's presents. So she put him on a ton of park 
uh, supplements and we treated his basal ganglia and his substantia nigra and took about eight months, but he's done. And that was 2005, 2006. It's 2019 and he is pretty bad about taking supplements, <laughs> but it hasn't come back and I haven't treated him. He doesn't treat himself. He's about as stubborn as any eight to four year old human can be. It's like, well, I'll treat it if it comes back. Hasn't come back. It's like, okay. They caught it early. They did a comprehensive approach to creating a stable state for the tissue that's a problem. And then they used FS, we used FSM as an adjunct. So can't put tissue back that's not there. Mm -hmm. Partial, total rotator cuff tear or ACL tear is a tear. It's done. Have the surgery. I'll treat you afterwards. You get better in two weeks. That's easy. Partial thickness tear looks like we can fix that. Right. So there like once you can do um, something that's what is that? There's a there's a poster that I've seen. Um, be realistic, expect a miracle, yeah. but be patient. The impossible takes slightly longer than the difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. it. Expect it's miracles from your body and be patient and, and support it. Give it the raw building blocks it needs. Take your supplements, eat the foods you're supposed to eat, avoid the foods that harm you and, uh, and get some FSM, right? You got it. Right. That's, that is the plan. I like it. You got it. How, how can we find a <laughs> practitioner? Do you have a list of practitioners uh, that we can go search and yes. find a local one? Yes, it is. Um, uh, it's on the website is www.frequenciespecific.com. That will have, it's got a, a links to the YouTube videos, to the webinars that we've done. Um, and it's got a, a seminar list um, for those of you that are practitioner trained. And for the patients, there is a practitioner list that after, uh, let's see. 15, 18, 17 years was largely inaccurate. It was incomplete. People had stopped using it. People retired. People died. They were still on the list. The patient had to call six providers to find somebody that was still doing it. So last year we made the list subscription and it cut down the number of uh, providers that are listed on our practitioner list. But the ones that are there are paying $89 a year to be there. So their information is accurate and you can look at that list, find somebody near you and find out what their qualifications are, how many seminars they've taken, are they keeping up um, uh, and all of that. So it's, it's smaller than it used to be, but it's, it's probably better. <laughs> Yo, I think sounds better to me. Frequency yeah. I'll make sure the links yep. to everything that you do is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast at learn So we'll make sure that everyone has access to the links to your YouTube and that list and your website and especially your book, which I think everyone should get and purchase and give to their practitioners, give to their chiropractor and their doctor and their functional yes. medicine practitioner and their nurse practitioner and, we should absolutely uh, be handing your book out and telling people to listen to this episode and listen and read your book because I'd love to uh, just c continue to get more and more practitioners certified so that this uh, can be, uh, we can, no matter where we are in the world, we can go, oh, I, I tore my, yes. you know, I, I, you know. I ran and fell and tore my ankle and it's not a full tear. And I really want to go find a practitioner within the next four hours and we can do that, right? We need to have it be yep. that popular. Or I know I'm going in for surgery or I want to be able to uh, heal as quickly as possible. Um, I, yeah, have, I have two. You hold, more... that, you hold that vision because I that is my vision. <laughs> bless, bless you. <laughs> and, and we have had patients we have had practitioners come to seminars where the patient went in, handed them the seminar schedule, handed them the book and said, I will pay for you to take the class. Brilliant. And there are patients that do that. I mean, the class is four days. 
and it's twelve hundred dollars, eleven ninety five. There are student rates. There are, but it's it's an investment for a practitioner. And so, there are patients that want a practitioner. Well, you can create one. Find somebody that's willing to try it, and then do just exactly what you just described. I love it. Absolutely. You know, if I was, if I had an illness that, you know, that needed to be healing and there wasn't a practitioner near me, I could absolutely see um, doing that exact thing, going to my chiropractor or my naturopath and saying, you know, I'll pay for you to take it. And then, and then you treat me. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's, that's a deal. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I do have, a, I, of course, I've got a million questions for you, but I'll, I will definitely wrap it up. I'm going to make this interview a two-parter because okay. we, I just, I could learn <laughs> from you all day. I could listen to you. This has been wonderful. So when that, when that frequency list was first created, the world was such a different place. We we are now exposed to a far greater amount of um, environmental pollutants and new new chemicals, and I know in some ways back then, you know, in the 30s and 40s, I mean, we we had we did have a, a huge load of toxins um, like lead in the gasoline, for example, and you know, dirty coal and all that kind of stuff. But now we just have a a much different load. We have environmental pollutants from microplastics and obesogens and endocrine disruptors and, and it's in our food and it's in our soil. And we've got, you know, the pesticides and herbicides that we did not have when that list was created. So there's a, a bigger need for supporting the body and detoxification of heavy metals and pesticides, um, PCBs, that kind of thing. Uh, for those people who are very toxic and and they're having difficulty uh getting getting this out of their body does your system support the kidneys and the liver to the point where they can really uh get the load out to get the like noticeably get the yeah. heavy metals out have you seen great yeah. success with that well yeah yes and heavy metals in particular we don't cover in the course seminar they're taught in the advanced and um Arsenic, there's no de detox reaction with it. And I've had enough patients that I treat with the frequency for arsenic. Their pain just goes down. Their headaches go away. That That's easy. Mercury is another critter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've made, I had one dentist that came in. He'd been really sick. He'd now gotten himself chelated and detoxed. And the first day I treated him with the frequency for mercury for about 10 minutes we were really careful and he felt better he did great the next week he came in and he and i got sidetracked talking and i treated him with the frequency to remove mercury for 40 minutes and he called the next day and he was as sick as he'd been mm. he was it was it so the frequencies for heavy metals in particular have to be used with a combined collaborative approach so the practitioners that do heavy metal chelation, you do oral or IV chelation. That's just, you, you do that. Frequencies are not a substitute. In the advanced, when we talk about heavy metals in particular, you, you, you pack the system with what it takes to bind the metals. I was so ignorant when I treated him in 98, 99, I guess. So you, you have them take chlorella and clay and charcoal for two days prior to the time that you treat them, and then you treat them. So heavy metals are tricky. Everything else, there are frequencies for organic toxins and regular toxins, inorganic toxins, certain poisons. But the toxin frequencies, and um, so that and inflammation. So if if somebody is toxic, oh the the printer another story sorry oh but please there was a, a <laughs> there was a printer who who uh, he owned a print print shop and he had been in business for twenty two years he'd been in pain for seventeen of the last twenty two years and he had run his business from bed for seven of the last 10 years. So he came in and he, he had trigger points everywhere. 
His body pain was a seven. And he said, I, I hear you're doing this trigger point therapy and I, I need you to treat my trigger points. And I'm looking at him thinking, if I dissolve one trigger point in this in this guy, he's going to be sick for a week. And I said, okay. So I, I didn't treat his trigger points. I treated toxicity and inflammation in the liver and the nervous system as a whole. I treated him for 20 minutes. At the end of 20 minutes, his pain went from a seven to a two. It never went above a two after that. So then the other piece of his depression and pain and sleep problems had to do with food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. You want to know what somebody's allergic to, you ask them what they eat. <laughs> and he said, what do you eat every day? He said, oh, every night I have this huge bowl of popcorn, sometimes twice a day. I love popcorn. Okay. And then he said, I've had a bellyache since I was 10. Oh my gosh. Every time I eat, my gut hurts. And I've had a stomach ache since I was 10. Well, the only people that have a stomach ache since they're 10 are celiac. They're gluten sensitive. So I said, okay, here's the deal. You don't get any grains at all for six weeks. And he looked at me and I said, you've been sick for 35 years because he was whatever, 10, he was 45. You've been sick for 35 years. Give me six weeks. And he said, okay, now. When their pain goes from a seven to a two, they listen to you. Mm -hmm. So now his pain's a two. I tell him I want to go off of all grains. What am I going to eat? Well, you know, fruits, <laughs> vegetables, meat. That, that works. Okay. So he could have eggs. So all grains for six weeks. And at the end of a week, his belly pain was gone. And at the end of three or four weeks, he was off of one or two of the three antidepressants he was on. He was off of one of the sleep medications. And Monday of the sixth week, he came in and he said, okay, now what do I do? I said, well, Friday. Friday, you can have anything you want all day. And he looked at me and he said, why Friday? I said, well, if I'm right, you'll know by Saturday whether or not this makes a difference. So he came in the next Tuesday and he gave me this look. <laughs> and I went, oh, how bad was it? And I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, how long were you in bed? He said, all of Saturday and half of Sunday. He said, I can live without popcorn. And that was it. He was done after being sick for 17 years. Now he had been exposed to toxins. So mm -hmm. I treated his liver and I, but his pain was a combination of immune system activation because of the food sensitivities. So part of my challenge with people that say, oh, I, I feel this way or that way, or I have these symptoms or that pain because I'm toxic. Well, maybe. Is it toxicity or do you have a disc bulge that's giving you pain and that challenges your vagus and so your liver stops working as well because as far as your vagus is concerned, you're going to be dead in 30 minutes. So why would it detoxify anything or digest your food? Mm. So it's not just right. And so it's like practitioners that say, oh, this is emotional or it's all in your head or because you were abused as a child. Well. Yes, that's possible, but if, if the practitioner, if what the practitioner does is not what's going to fix it, and the practitioner then decides, well, since he couldn't fix you, then it must be emotional. Once they, whoever, says it's emotional, then it's your fault. Right. And so my, my master's degree is in psychology and counseling. 
So once it's emotional and it came from early childhood trauma, there is the idea in psychology and medicine that that takes years and years to fix. And so you're just doomed to be in pain because it's emotional. And I, I object to that in the most strenuous way. And usually my language is a little more colorful than <laughs> saying that I object strenuously. And so, because I would say 80% of the people that I treated in the 10 years that I was in a really busy practice, they were all told it was in their head. They all had an early life emotional trauma because that sensitizes the midbrain. It's like, well, that's not that hard to fix. So it's, it's like, yes, it's toxicity and inflammation will change a huge number of symptoms. They make your nervous system work better. They reduce your pain. It helps you with depression and sleep. And, and yes, their toxins are different than they were in 1922. But they're, the effect on the body is roughly the same. They mm -hmm. change cell signaling. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. Oh my God. I'm not even sure if I want to, oh, you poor thing. Okay. So, but I have just, just one little thing. So when we treat somebody for toxicity, okay, what we found over time is treating them for toxicity. Let's say toxicity in the brain changes brain fog. Toxicity in the liver changes liver tenderness and pain. Toxicity mm -hmm. in the nervous system changes body pain. But when we treat people for toxicity, they don't have, quote unquote, detox reactions. They don't get sick. And if what we're doing is removing toxins physically, they should get sick. Mm -hmm. You should release them, should pack up in the liver. You should have a, quote unquote, detox reaction. And they don't. So... After 15 years of trying to figure this out, this lady in Australia gave me a model for how that actually happened. She said, well, okay, these toxins are lipid soluble, they're fat soluble, and your cell membranes are fat soluble, and your nervous system membranes are fat soluble. So these organic toxins just slide right into the membrane and lay in the membrane. But they're laying in the membrane next to one of these receptors, kind of like Remember the key in the lock? Mm -hmm. These receptors that look like little antenna. Well, you get this heavy organic chemical that lays in this membrane and it tilts the axis of this receptor. It changes it. So now the cell doesn't work right because this toxin just changed the receptor orientation and configuration, basically electromagnetically or chemically, right? Now, here's the problem. You were exposed to toxins when you were in Vietnam and got hit with Agent Orange, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So your cells change, but that was 1972. You don't have a single cell in your body that was there in 1972. Right. You don't have a single cell in your gut that was there four days ago, right? Mm -hmm. So the cell turns over, and when the cell membrane is replicated, that toxin gets released a little bit at a time, and the liver can deal with that. So the liver excretes it, the kidney excretes it. But the signaling, when the cell gets reproduced, the antenna is reproduced in this same cattywampus configuration. So the memory of the toxin is still there. The body is still yes. remembering it. Yes. It changes the function. So what we do is we change the antenna. We change the antenna. We send a signal that reorients, reorients the antenna as it was before the toxin was there. So they don't tend to get detox reactions. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. It's very cool. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm on the edge of my seat this entire interview, and I definitely want to have you back on the show anytime, anytime okay. you want to come teach, you want a platform to share information. Uh, you are 
welcome to come back here because we could dive into all kinds of things. Okay, I've got one one last one. Okay. Uh, I know I I'll know several people who have now is it tinnitus or tinnitus? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And I know that there's different causes of it. Uh, have you had uh, positive results for that? Because <sighs> it can be like life changing when someone has it they can hardly hear but they're constantly hearing a noise and it keeps them up at night and it's almost like yeah. being deaf but constantly hearing a noise um right have you have you had positive results with shifting that uh, i wish there are there's one kind of tinnitus that comes from trigger points in the scm and that we can treat the trigger points and that goes away but i got tinnitus after taking a baby aspirin every day for a year, my liver does not detoxify aspirin. And so the aspirin poisons. So aspirin and Advil, all of the NSAIDs mm -hmm. poison the little hair cells in your cochlea. Mm. So I woke up with tinnitus after a year on baby aspirin in 2007, 2008. And so I lived with it for a really long time. And then my hearing got so bad I really miss the quiet, but my hearing got so bad that my daughter said, mom, you need hearing aids. So I went and had a hearing test and sure enough, I needed hear hearing aids. When I put the hearing aids in, tinnitus went away. So I order a lot of vestibular tests. So I called the audiologist at Good Samaritan and said, what is up with tinnitus? And she said, well, tinnitus is like phantom limb pain for your ears. When you lose high frequency hearing input into your brain, the high frequency sounds are the first ones that go in the cochlea, in the hearing mechanism that's in your ear, that little snail shell thing. Mm -hmm. The high frequency goes first. When the brain loses that input, it's like phantom limb pain and the brain just starts humming to itself <laughs> on the same frequencies that you just lost. Mm -hmm. And I can't put tissue back that's not there. Mm. So the way I treated my tinnitus after taking whatever supplements they told me to take for tinnitus did zip for six months. I finally got hearing aids and now my tinnitus is down by 80% as soon as I put my hearing aids in because I have input. Got it. So the aspirin yeah. uh, damaged, damaged tissue. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's different causes of it. So you're saying if someone has it, yeah. they should definitely go to a, a practitioner that, uh, that practices FSM just in case their tinnitus is uh, well, related would, to the trigger The first point. thing I would do would be, uh, yes, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. If you reach up and you grab your SCM and it hurts, well then, okay, go to see an FSM practitioner. But if somebody have, has tinnitus, go get a hearing test. Right. See an audiologist. It's like I I live very comfortably with one foot in each of both worlds. You can do both. Yes. Go get your hearing tested. I got to tell you from experience, it's worth every penny you spend on proper hearing aids. And go see an FSM practitioner to make sure your SCM is behaving itself. There you go. Very cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just have a million questions, but, um, oh, I, I, we'll have to do this again. We'll have to do this again because I mean, I just, I respect you so much and I just want to get, I, I'm, I'm now one of your cheerleaders. I want to get your Yay! information out and I want, I want all the practitioners to know about, I seriously have a list down this entire page of people I'm about to call <laughs> And tell them about you. So God bless you. I'm really looking forward to having you back on the show. It would be so great. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us today. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up today's interview? Oh, I just want to tell you how grateful I am to have a, a platform and a way to get the word out. There is, there is no reason. It's just not right that FSM is the best kept secret in the country. So... Getting the word out is the next step. We spent 22 years building a foundation of credibility and well-trained practitioners, and good equipment and reproducible results so that now when we get the word out, patients can find a practitioner near them that's trained. And there's there's two two things. If I had a hashtag, it would be you don't have to live with it. 
right? Mm -hmm. There's it, it. There's nothing that's a hundred percent, but you don't necessarily have to live with, live with it. So FSM means hope. That's that's what's important. Is that it may not be a hundred percent, but it means hope. It means that there's an opportunity for a new way of looking at things and a new way of treating things to contribute to the patient's comfort and well-being. And then the other, the other thing I would close with is what we close every seminar with. Um, and that is, it's, it's not a mission statement. It is, it's what we do. Frequency specific microcurrent is, is changing medicine. That is after 22 years, that is the truth but it's changing medicine one patient at a time. When you treat a patient who had stroke pain and that patient is out of pain in 60 minutes and can treat it reproducibly and predictably, that changes the doctor that treats that patient. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately, when you get a big enough pool, that changes medicine. But it's too big a job to change medicine, but I can change one patient at a time. And then my job is to change patients' lives one practitioner at a time. Every practitioner that I train that goes to the seminars, and you can watch the light bulbs go off in their head. <laughs> you can bet. watch them get it on day two. It gives me goosebumps. So you change patients' lives one practitioner at a time. And those, the important thing about FSM is not so much what I've done with it, as far as I'm concerned. That's not the important part. The important part is that it's reproducible and teachable and that every practitioner that I train, especially in the last five or six years, can go out and do good things on their own. And then when you think about it, what our true mission is, is that changing even one patient's life can change the world. Yeah. So that patient that had the RSD and the fibromyalgia that in two weeks was completely recovered and it was permanent. How did the world change because Shauna Haggerty was out of pain and a good mom and a productive citizen and a happy person? How did, how did her joy radiate out into the world into such a way to change her family, her home and her community? So that's what we do. And I would just invite anybody that's listening who has a similar set of, of goals and objectives and preferences that you join us and try it out. Can't hurt. Might help. Absolutely. It absolutely will. Thank you so much, Dr. Carolyn McMakin. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. This isn't goodbye because I no, definitely want to have you back. And I know listeners will be sharing this episode. We're going to turn this ripple into a tidal wave and help as many people as possible yes. to find true health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's been a real pleasure. If you have blood sugar issues and you're looking to finally resolve them, I would love to work with you. Please go to bloodsugarcoach.com, put in your information, and you'll be able to book a free 30-minute session with me. And we can see how I can help you. I have personally resolved my own type 2 diabetes. I am no longer a diabetic, and I did so with natural medicine. I've gone on to help a lot of people to also completely resolve their blood sugar issues so that they now have normal blood sugar. So if you'd like to no longer have blood sugar issues, please go to bloodsugarcoach.com. That's bloodsugarcoach.com. I look forward to working with you.